All right, everyone, welcome, welcome back. Um, thank you for coming back this afternoon. Um, I'm in the very fortunate position of introducing um, two people who really need no introduction, especially to this audience. Uh, John Curtis was Keeper of the Middle East, uh, Keeper of the Middle East Department of the British Museum from 1989 to 2011, um, during which time he created a number of very important um, exhibits, including Art and Empire, Treasures from Assyria in the BM, um, and Forgotten Empire, The World of Ancient Persia. John's work on the history and um, archaeology of Iran and Iraq um, has been absolutely prolific. Um, when I checked the other day, it's probably not even up to date on the British Academy website. Um, it says he's published 23 books, more than 100 articles. I shudder to think um, the energy that has gone into that. I certainly don't have it. Um, John is now CEO of the Iran Heritage Foundation and is here to talk to us about the destruction, preservation, and restoration of cultural heritage in Iraq. Um, so welcome, John. Um, thank you for that very kind uh, introduction, and thank you too to um, Fiona Hara for inviting me to um, give a lecture at this uh, very interesting uh, event. Um, I should start, I think, by saying that um, the subject uh, which I've got is obviously uh, an enormous one. I can't possibly cover uh, all aspects of it, so I'm going to really focus um, on some case studies and uh, I hope in the course of the lecture uh, make some observations which we can perhaps um, talk about later. One thing I won't be doing in this lecture is uh, trying to um, establish who was responsible for what and why they did it. Uh, I'm going to leave that to my colleague Matthew Bogdanos. I think that'll probably be perhaps the main thrust uh, of his paper. So what I'm going to do, as I said, is look at some case studies, uh, tell you what's happened, and make some remarks about uh, recovery and restoration. Um, well, I'll, I'm starting with the uh, Iraq Museum, uh, then I'm going to go on to the uh, Mosul Museum, then we'll look at some of the uh, sites in southern Iraq that uh, I visited in 2008. Uh, then we'll look at Babylon and um, Mosul, uh, Nimrud, and we'll finish up with the uh, Basra Museum, which um, Eleanor referred to this morning. Well, um, I arrived uh, in Baghdad, in this context, that is, um, on the 24th of April um, 2003, which was... Um, 13 days after the looting, and uh, Matthew Bogdanos uh, was already there with his uh, US um, cultural protection uh, force, but um, at that moment, uh, nobody uh, had done anything much, and everybody was uh, in a state of shock. And you'll see why, because um, these were the sorts of scenes which greeted everybody uh, in the Iraq Museum. <clears throat> statues thrown to the floor uh, and, uh, and smashed and very often trampled um, underfoot. Uh, that was in the public galleries. Uh, then um, in the offices, of which I think there were about a hundred, uh, every single one of them had been uh, broken into the safes, um, ransacked, and where there were antiquities in the storerooms um, thrown onto the floor. Uh, what you can see here on the left um, is some uh, trayfuls of ancient ivories. Well, I won't, uh, uh, I, I won't talk too long about the Iraq Museum because I think probably uh, Matthew is going to um, come back to that. Um, but it's worth recording that um, of um, about, uh, let's say, 50 really important pieces that were still in the galleries, uh, a lot of the items had already been removed to what was called um, a secret store, uh, and those were untouched. But uh, of about 50 items that have left, were left behind in the galleries, uh, these are some of them which, thanks to the uh, efforts of people like Matthew and Donny George, um, were recovered. Uh, and of these important items um, from the galleries, 
I think there's only two really significant things which are still missing. Uh, one's this wonderful ivory plaque um, showing uh, a lioness um, attacking an Ethiopian, uh, and the other is a head um, from, uh, from Hatra. The um, objects in the storerooms haven't fared um, so well. Um, it's very difficult um, to cite numbers, mainly uh, because the records uh, in the Iraq Museum were very imprecise in the first place. But it's thought that probably around 16,000 objects were missing, and around about 8,000 of those um, have been recovered. So still out there is about 8,000, including the Iraq Museum's incomparable collection of seals. Um, the, that's the uh, bad news. Um, the good news is that the uh, Iraq Museum did reopen in 2005, um, due largely to the uh, thanks of uh, Italian colleagues and the generosity of the uh, Italian government. Um, and as you'll see here, it's already uh, attracting um, large numbers of visitors. So full credit to our Italian colleagues for enabling that uh, to happen. Uh, and I only wish that the British government um, was uh, so generous. Uh, the Italians have a wonderful record uh, around the world, I think, of, um, uh, of um, promoting, restoring um, cultural heritage. Well, now I'm, I'll come on now to the Mosul Museum. Um, this was similarly looted um, on the 10th to 11th of April 2003, uh, exactly uh, on the same dates as the Iraq Museum uh, in Baghdad, which certainly lends support um, to the belief that um, uh, all of this um, looting and ransacking was in some kind of a way uh, orchestrated, but I think uh, even to this day we don't exactly know um, by, uh, by who, but it certainly can't be a coincidence that it happened at exactly the same time. So these are um, views in the Mosul Museum. On the left is the um, um, bronze gates from Balawat in northern Iraq. The wood, of course, is, is modern, but the, uh, the bronze uh, sheeting on top of it is all ancient, and most of it, as you see, has been um, ripped off. Um, it wasn't actually as bad, the uh, damage in Mosul Museum, uh, as the damage um, in uh, Baghdad, uh, I have to say, but unfortunately, um, worse was to befall the uh, Mosul Museum, and I'll fast forward now to um, um, 2015, and this is the damage as recorded on one of the uh, ISIS videos. Um, there was a lot of material still there, still left uh, in the uh, Mosul Museum, as I said, after um, the, the looters had entered uh, in 2003. And most of the material uh, in the museum was, were, was actually original pieces. Um, it's very unfortunate um, that at the time, the early news broadcasts uh, said that a lot of the, that the damage um, uh, inflicted by ISIS hadn't been bad because most of the pieces in the museum uh, were cast. That actually um, was not true. They're nearly all originals, either Assyrian pieces uh, or pieces um, from uh, Hatra. So their loss uh, is indeed um, very, very unfortunate. But um, since this uh, disaster, um, two um, archaeologists, Chance Kohano and Matthew Vincent, have been working to create a virtual Mosul museum uh, online. Uh, and in January of this year, there was even an exhibition in the museum uh, of virtual representations of destroyed artifacts that were recreated uh, as high quality 3D prints. And that was done in collaboration with Google um, Arts, uh, Arts and Culture. And they were able to do this um, through the two archaeologists through crowdsourcing um, thousands of, um, of photographs. 
Um, going back again now to, um, to sorry, another image from uh, Mosul Museum to um, 2003. Uh, in those years, 2003-04, um, a lot of uh, archaeological sites um, were very badly uh, looted. I expect Matthew will talk about this uh, in due course. One of the worst affected um, was Isin in um, southern Iraq. All of these little holes uh, over the site represent uh, diggings uh, by uh, looters. Uh, another very badly affected site um, was uh, Umar. And uh, in 2008, so this is a few years after, and one wasn't quite sure what the situation was uh, in uh, 2008, um, a small group of us, which actually included um, the chairman of the State Board of Antiquities and Heritage, was able, um, through, uh, uh, through, um, through uh, actually was organized uh, by the uh, British Army, we were able to visit some eight sites um, in southern Iraq to establish um, how bad the looting had been and still was. And the picture that we got um, was actually um, a very mixed one. Um, in some places, uh, we discovered damage that had been caused even before the war started. This is the famous site of Tel Ubaid, which is near uh, Oa. And what you can see here um, is uh, hollows which have been dug out uh, by the Iraq army for military vehicles. This was to defend uh, the main road uh, coming up from up from the uh, from the south that the coalition troops um, were using, uh, so they turned this ancient site into a fortified uh, defensive um, position. So that's the damage that you can see uh, in uh, that place. So it's not uh, quite true, obviously, to say that uh, all or most of the military damage is caused by coalition forces. It's um, rather shared between the two. Uh, Lhasa, the site that we went to, um, there was looting, but it appeared not to have been uh, as bad as at Umar and Isin, and hadn't um, occurred uh, recently. So what we found was a mixture in 2008. Some looting still continuing, but on a, a, a limited, a limited uh, level. Uh, some sites are still um, quite bad. Uh, I'm showing you this, uh, these pictures of Ur because, of course, it's a very iconic site, one of the best-known sites um, in southern Iraq, where Leonard Woolley dug in the 1920s and 30s, um, where there's a royal cemetery. And the problem with uh, Ur is that the site is immediately next to um, what has now become the largest airbase in the Middle East, uh, called Talil. Um, and at Talil, in the early years of the Allied occupation, um, there were thousands of uh, troops, and they had unlimited access um, to the site and wandered around it. Uh, in a fairly uncontrolled sort of a way. However, as far as uh, we could see um, at that time, um, there hadn't really been um, very much damage caused um, by the military uh, at, uh, at uh, Ur. Uh, and in fact, the local people uh, even profited from the, uh, from, from the presence of uh, troops uh, at Ur by opening up a souvenir and a gift shop, as you see. Um, there was some damage, but uh, this is damage of a different type uh, caused by uh, incoming missiles fired, fired by uh, insurgents um, from the area of, uh, of Basra. Um, the ziggurat at Ur, which is one of the best known landmarks um, at Ur, um, was damaged. A lot of shell holes um, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the ziggurat uh, caused by uh, we don't know who, but um, um, this man here, um, who for want of a better word I should say was my minder, I suppose, uh, was able to tell by looking at the holes exactly um, what sort of munition uh, artillery had caused um, each one of them. And there were a lot of complaints actually from the Iraq Department of Antiquities about this damage um, to, the, uh, to the ziggurat. 
Right, I want to move on to um, Babylon. All of these coast stories are actually quite different um, in themselves. Uh, Babylon, you will know, is another uh, very iconic site. Um, it's on the uh, river Euphrates, about 50 miles south um, of, uh, of Baghdad. And uh, on either side of the Euphrates there are groves of um, palm trees. So it's a rather uh, attractive um, location. Um, this, uh, this is uh, pre pre-war damage before the, uh, well, during, I suppose, the coalition of invasion of 2003. Um, lots of uh, foxholes were dug uh, around the site for defending uh, troops, defending Iraqi troops, um, that is, and, and these are just uh, two of them. Um, the only other thing that happened to, Baghdad, to, Basra, to Babylon uh, immediately after the uh, invasion was that the gift shop um, was torched. Um, nothing worse than that. But then very soon, um, coalition troops uh, established a, a major military camp known as Camp Alpha at uh, Babylon. Uh, and as you can see, uh, this uh, camp is situated firmly right in the center of the uh, ancient city um, on the um, east bank um, of, the, of, the, of the Euphrates River. Um, and uh, the existence of this camp caused a lot of very adverse comment in the uh, international press. Um, there were actually howls of uh, protest from various correspondents. And in December 2004, uh, I was asked to go to Babylon by the minister, Iraqi Minister of Culture to compile a, compile a condition report uh, about what had, damage had been done by the military presence um, at uh, Babylon. Um, and I have to say it was um, quite considerable. Obviously, um, driving very heavy military vehicles around an ancient site um, is not uh, a very good thing to do. Uh, and they even uh, drove these vehicles down the famous um, ancient processional way, uh, it's called, um, breaking a lot of the, a lot of the tiles. Um, I should say, actually, that uh, I'm not attributing blame to any one particular um, country or anything like that. There were a lot of different countries uh, in, the, in the coalition, and many of them uh, were involved in these various exercises that uh, I'm, I'm describing. Uh, then um, there was a heliport on top of established on top of the uh, on top of the site. Uh, there had always been uh, a helicopter landing pad on the top of Babylon, but now it was um, greatly uh, expanded, um, as you can see, and um, large amounts of. Um, of the, I won't call it topsoil, it's probably the top two or three meters of archaeological deposit um, were scooped up um, to put into these so-called HESCO um, containers that you can see um, down below. They're like gigantic uh, sandbags. And the problem here is that um, the military authorities were alerted at some point to the fact that they shouldn't be doing uh, this. So what they did instead was bring earth in from outside Babylon, from, uh, from the desert and from other sites uh, in the vicinity. Some of them also, in their own right, uh, archaeological, which was even worse, because um, uh, when these HESCO uh, containers decompose as um, they're intended to do, this means that the archaeological uh, record of Babylon will be uh, irreparably uncontaminated. Um, then long uh, trenches uh, were dug, I think for no very good reason. Uh, they're said to be uh, anti-tank defences, but as far as I know, the insurgent, insurgents never had any tanks. However that may be, um, the trench at the top left was 170 metres long and about um, 3 metres deep straight through previously undisturbed archaeological deposits and of course um, a lot of material was turned up like ancient pottery and bricks of the Babylonian king um, Nebuchadnezzar. 
there was a fuel farm and of course um, many thousands of gallons of fuel um, leaked into the uh, into the ground uh, underneath again contaminating the archaeological record and some of the um, um, the dragon figures, Mushushu figures, in the foundations of the Ishtar Gate um, were damaged, obviously, uh, by soldiers looking for um, souvenirs. And in fact, um, while I was there, one departing group um, of soldiers were searched, and uh, as you can see on the table here, some of the things which were retrieved um, um, from, from, from the outgoing luggage. Um, however, um, some good came out of all this in that uh, Babylon um, then was taken under the wing of the World Monuments Fund and the WMF uh, then uh, financed um, the compiling of a site management plan um, for uh, Babylon. This is a very good thing and it is uh, ongoing work. Um, it does require actually an awful lot of um, research and so on, but it does mean that uh, when this is all finished, everybody will be in the best place to do further investigation, research and work on Babylon. Now, I want to talk a little bit now um, about um, restoration, um, at Babylon in particular to start with. Excavations at Babylon were conducted between 1899 and uh, 2017 by a German team led by uh, Robert Kuldervey. You can see him here on the uh, bottom left. Um, they discovered a great deal about the topography of uh, ancient Babylon and about the history um, of the site. I have to say they did um, very valuable work. But at the end of that exercise, there really wasn't very much to see um, at Babylon, just as much as there hadn't been very much to see in the first place before the Germans um, started work. And what you see uh, on the left is uh, how the site looked in um, 1917 when it was occupied um, by the uh, British Army. And the two postcards on the right are from the decades after uh, 1917. Um, the uh, best known monument uh, from uh, Babylon um, was uh, taken to Berlin. Um, it's the so-called uh, Ishtar Gate, where it's now one of the highlights of the Near Eastern Museum there. Uh, what is left uh, in um, Babylon are the foundations um, of the Ishtar Gate. It was that that I showed you just now, where some bricks had been um, removed. And this is uh, how it appears um, in a 1930s uh, postcard. Well, um, that was Babylon then in the, let's say, up until the Second World War. Then I think in the 1950s or 60s, the Iraqis themselves uh, did build this half-sized replica of the um, Ishtar goat, which they put up um, at the entrance to the site. Uh, and uh, that's actually uh, about all that happened uh, until Saddam Hussein came along. And he determined to build a palace uh, at uh, Babylon. Um, it's actually um, on the top of this um, circular mound that you can see uh, on the left side with um, a roadway um, sort of curving up, snaking round uh, to go into the uh, palace. Um, and for this he was very much condemned, but uh, it has to be said that um, this uh, artificial mound, the whole thing is built on the top of an artificial mound, um, and the, uh, w was actually uh, placed uh, in what had been the ancient bed of the river Euphrates. The river Euphrates has actually changed course um, over the centuries. So it's not quite as bad uh, as it appeared to be, uh, to be uh, to, as it appeared to some people um, at the time. It, in order to create this uh, huge mound, 
he didn't actually um, cover or destroy uh, any archaeological deposits. Not necessarily that it was an acceptable thing to do. It obviously wasn't, but uh, it could have been worse. Uh, and this is uh, a, a, a photograph of the palace uh, as it appears um, nowadays. Uh, and as you can see, it's got uh, a very elaborate, uh, ornate decoration uh, inside. This is one of the, the roofs, uh, the ceilings of um, one um, of the rooms. Um, well, Saddam also did uh, some restoration work uh, at, uh, at Babylon, not content with just building a, a palace there. He rebuilt the ancient Greek um, theater uh, and turned it uh, into a structure which I think actually could accommodate something like 2,500 people, an, enormous, uh, an enormously large um, audience. And you can see that um, uh, this theater in the aerial photograph um, above. Uh, and various other things were done, like putting the famous line of Babylon into uh, a prominent uh, sort of a position so it could easily be seen um, by uh, visitors. But the, 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 the largest thing that he did at Babylon was to reconstruct the palace um, of Nebuchadnezzar. And you can see it here, uh, viewed from the mound on which the um, Saddam Palace um, is, um, is situated. Uh, here it is, uh, it's a photograph I took from a helicopter, this one. And actually it's interesting because apart from the restored palace on the left-hand side, uh, what you can see on the right uh, is some remains of the military camp. Um, there it is uh, from a, um, an aerial photo satellite photograph, I think. Um, and uh, in fact, um, this palace um, is absolutely huge. It contains, as you can see, five courtyards uh, and a total of um, 600 rooms. And the restoration uh, is actually uh, on a gigantic scale so that the main entrance to the palace uh, is through a reconstructed arch 30 meters high and many of the walls um, have now been uh, rebuilt to a height of um, 18 uh, meters. Um, the picture on the right shows on the uh, left side um, a heroic figure uh, who, whose name will be known to many of you um, Dr. Donnie George, who did so much uh, to help um, recover, um, preserve and promote um, Iraqi cultural heritage. And uh, sadly, uh, he died uh, in March 2011 at the early age um, uh, of 60. But he was particularly instrumental in drawing public attention to the looting of the uh, Iraq Museum. And as I've said, he played a, a key role together with uh, Matthew Bogdanos uh, in recovering uh, many of the stolen items. But what is less well known perhaps um, is that um, for a while uh, Donny George was actually in charge of the Babylon um, restoration project and uh, I had the uh, opportunity to talk to him about that because a lot of people, a lot of archaeologists um, were very, very critical um, of this project. But um, as he said to me, um, there was nothing whatever for people to see at Babylon, either the local people um, or um, tourists. So we felt um, that it would be a, a good thing to humor um, Saddam um, in this uh, in this uh, respect. Um, so that's really the, the history of the rebuilding of um, Nebuchadnezzar's palace, uh, which incidentally was uh, done in part uh, using new specially made bricks with uh, an inscription of um, Saddam uh, Hussein uh, on them. Uh, but I want now to digress um, a little bit and just ask, uh, whether Saddam uh, really knew what he was uh, restoring. And this um, has a bearing, of course, on uh, the principles of um, restoration work um, generally. Uh, on the right, you can see um, the palace 
uh, in its entirety um, with the five different courtyards. Uh, and on the left, you can see just the western part um, of the uh, palace. Um, now, it's always been known that the little structure in green, which is tacked on at the, uh, tacked on at the uh, left hand side, uh, was a later addition by the Persian king Artaxerxes II. Um, it's, it's clear for various reasons. It's actually in uh, uh, the style of a Persian um, Apadana building, and as nobody has ever questioned um, the identification um, of that building. But now um, a Belgian archaeologist, Hermann Gash, has suggested that the whole of the west part um, of this palace um, was actually built uh, in the Persian period. Um, and in particular, I think the argument is completely convincing in terms of the, uh, the, 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 the left-hand um, courtyard because, A, it's not bonded um, with the building uh, next to it, uh, and B, it's got um, a peculiar type of... Um, I'll have to go over to the screen and explain to you. It's got these two reception rooms here, which is called... It's an architectural design, which uh, is called a salle quatre salons, which is a room with four buttresses. And the idea is that uh, these buttresses, they're, 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 they're um, supported um, transverse barrel roofs at either end and a barrel roof running down the center. And this is a very distinctive um, uh, Iranian Persian uh, design. So I think it is certain that uh, that part of the palace was um, uh, added on in the uh, Persian period and probably the courtyard next to it um, as well. There's some good evidence um, that that um, might have been. And we know, incidentally, that the whole palace was also um, used throughout the Persian period, as you can see from these um, two columns uh, here in one of the courtyards. So the great irony here, obviously, is that Saddam, during the Iraq-Iran war, spent millions, probably billions, um, of dinars restoring uh, a palace which may in the first place have been partly uh, Iranian. Um, anyway, <laughs> the question I think is should the palace have been uh, rebuilt? Um, I take the same view as Donny George. Yes, I think that it should have been. There was very little for visitors to see uh, at Babylon um, without that. I think it is a good thing, but it was built uh, on the cheap um, um, and it was thrown up in a very short uh, period of time uh, and there are some now severe problems as you can see there's um, rising damp um, and uh, some of the floors uh, are buckling uh, and it's going to be an absolute nightmare to conserve I really don't know um, what can be done about it but it's all this restoration work uh, at Babylon which has prevented it from being uh, nominated as a World Heritage Site. So I don't know what the outcome um, of all that uh, is going to be. I'm going on now to uh, Mosul, which, as you heard this morning, um, was occupied by Daesh. Um, uh, between 2014 and 2017 and during that time they did an incredible amount of damage to the architectural and cultural um, heritage of Mosul. Um, this is one of, the, uh, one of the very significant buildings that was blown up um, very early on in the Daesh occupation. This is the, the shrine of Nebi Yunus of the um, Prophet Jonah and the minaret uh, in the shrine was a landmark for uh, many miles around but that was uh, of course uh, doesn't exist uh, anymore. Uh, one interesting uh, fact here is that uh, after the shrine had been blown up it was discovered underneath it um, that there were lots of tunnels and these tunnels 
um, had been made into what proved to be um, an Assyrian palace of uh, Esau Hutton. I don't think any damage had been done to the reliefs that were exposed uh, in these tunnels. And everybody's assumed um, that these were tunnels which were done by um, Daesh, but I myself am not so sure about this. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if some of them at least at the end of the day proved to have been uh, done by um, Layard or Rassam, the early um, British excavators at, uh, at Nineveh, because of course um, they weren't allowed to excavate uh, in the vicinity um, of, the, uh, of the shrine. Um, these are uh, two more um, monuments in Mosul that have been completely destroyed, the tomb of Jarjis and uh, others are the famous Al-Nuri Mosque um, and the Al-Hadba uh, Minaret. But um, the uh, the, some of these buildings I think are scheduled to be uh, reconstructed uh, with money um, from the um, United Arab Emirates and um, from, uh, from Kuwait. Um, I think I, I, we haven't got time to go into that now and I don't really know enough about it, but uh, these reconstructions and offers of help in themselves sometimes are um, problematic. Sorry, I've gone on a bit too far. Well, then on 10th of September 2018, uh, UNESCO uh, held a meeting in Paris with the title Revive the Spirit um, of Mosul. Um, which I was privileged to be able to uh, attend. And at that meeting, um, Khais al-Rashid, the director of the State Board of Antiquities and Heritage, told us that 206 heritage buildings have been destroyed in Mosul, 431 significant heritage houses, 108 mosques, 15 shrines, and 19 uh, churches. Uh, we were then shown uh, harrowing scenes of the destroyed sites, um, some of them so completely flattened that the buildings could never um, be restored. In fact, um, some of these sites are now car lots. They've been deliberately turned uh, into car parks uh, in order to forestall any possible ideas of restoration and uh, rebuilding. Uh, some of the major buildings certainly uh, can be um, rebuilt. Whether they should be um, is a moot question. We heard this morning um, from uh, Eleanor about one of the churches uh, in Mosul that the local population was unlikely to return to worship there if it ever was um, rebuilt. But um, in general terms, I just want to tell you that at this UNESCO meeting, um, one of the officers of UNESCO made some uh, very, what I thought were very interesting points and he said that the following are all prerequisites to the restoration um, of residential areas such as Mosul. Number one is an obvious one, um, which is demining and making the area safe, that's clear. Now number two is something one doesn't necessarily think of, it's before you do anything you've got to uh, provide or reprovide basic services um, um, like uh, water, electricity, health care and schools. Not so easy as it sounds, obviously. Then thirdly, you've got to provide jobs and incomes for the people that are coming back um, to these uh, abandoned areas. And the fourth, most difficult of all, is uh, trying to promote um, community reconciliation. Very, very difficult uh, in a place like uh, Mosul. And then I think uh, we mustn't underestimate the difficulties and costs of uh, restoration. I remind you that um, 20 years after the end of the Bosnian War in 1995, practically the only monument rebuilt in Bosnia and Herzegovina is the old uh, Ottoman bridge in Mostar. And then there's the Neues Museum in Berlin um, on the Museum Island, destroyed uh, during World War II in 1943, only reopened in 
2009, after a restoration um, and rebuilding project supervised by David Chipperfield. And this, I remind you, uh, is in Germany with all its uh, financial resources and capacity. What hope is there, really, um, for Mosul? I, I'm going on now to um, Nimrud. This is a very old photograph which shows the um, ziggurat uh, at the end of the mound. Um, the main building, um, uh, well, uh, yes, well, I think one of the principal buildings um, at Nimrud, and the only one which had in any way been restored, was the Northwest Palace. Um, of uh, Ashurnasirpal uh, II. He was a 9th century uh, king. Um, excavations in that northwest palace had taken place uh, in the 19th century, principally by uh, Layard, and many of the reliefs from the northwest palace um, removed, for example, well, mainly to the British Museum, but also to other museums. Um, around the world, but there were nevertheless um, about 50 uh, reliefs still left there in the Northwest Palace. Uh, this is a view of the sort of reconstructed palace uh, as seen from the um, top of the um, ziggurat. Um, it's actually uh, a very interesting visitor experience, um, I have to say. These are uh, the colossal gateway figures being left behind by the um, early excavators. So this is how it was before the arrival of um, Daesh uh, on the site. And some of the reliefs there are extremely interesting because they preserve traces of uh, original color, like this one, where you can see that this uh, figure of a genie with a black beard. Nearly all the reliefs in the British Museum and other Western museums were scrubbed clean in the Victorian period when they arrived, so you, it's very difficult now to see any trace of these um, original uh, colors. Well, now we come on to the uh, Daesh uh, video, um, which was uh, released in April um, 2015. Uh, I won't dwell too long on this uh, because it's a very distressing uh, sight. The video shows um, insurgents um, smashing reliefs, um, gathering them up um, with a shovel. Uh, with laying barrels of uh, explosive um, next uh, to the uh, reliefs themselves uh, and then blowing them up in a massive um, explosion uh, which left us with a pile of um, rubble. Um, I know Ellen has been to Nimrud. I haven't since then, so uh, I don't know... Um, exactly uh, how bad it is. Well, one can obviously see that it's very, very uh, bad. But the question that arises, of course, is um, I I should uh, Nimrud be um, reconstructed? I referred to um, this UNESCO meeting um, in Paris, and there was a lot of discussion um, about it at the meeting. And interestingly, uh, nearly everybody at the meeting, including most of the UNESCO officials, were of the view that it shouldn't be um, restored. My view is totally different to that. Uh, I think that it should be. The palace should be restored, to brought back to something as it was uh, in the first place. I believe that that is something, uh, or I've been led to understand, that uh, that is something um, that the local population um, would uh, appreciate. Um, and, you know, the, the, the one of the things here is that, uh, yes, the palace as it was when it was blown up was mostly reconstruction in the first place. Certainly the reliefs were not. They were original pieces, but the walls and uh, roofs and so on um, had all been uh, rebuilt. And I'd like to remind you that when um, Max Mallowan and his wife Agatha Christie uh, arrived there in 1949, uh, there was nothing at all to see um, except um, the ziggurat. And um, 
Agatha Christie describes um, her reaction to Nimrud on first arrival. The Tigris was just a mile away, and on the great mound, big stone Assyrian heads poked out of the soil, and in one place there was the enormous wing of a great genie. And that's what you can see uh, in those photos there. Incidentally, the, uh, the photograph at the top shows the ziggurat at Nimrud, and this is a, a ziggurat um, that was 43 meters high, and this actually is, I suppose, the worst thing of all which has happened at uh, uh, Nimrud. This ziggurat has been completely um, demolished. I believe that the, um, the whole structure has been pushed into the uh, ancient bed um, of, of the Tigris. And this, um, is really a raising memory. You know, this ziggurat uh, was a landmark for um, many miles um, around. It was the most distinctive um, feature uh, in uh, the region, and to have removed it like this is to have taken it away, to have erased it, as I say, uh, from the uh, memory of, um, of local people. It was a quite appalling thing um, to do. I, I'm presumably, I suppose, there are probably enough um, photographs, or there could be, with crowdsourcing for um, the ziggurat to be put back again into some state as it was before, and I very much uh, hope um, that uh, it will be. Um, here are some more photographs uh, taken by Agatha Christie. No, not taken by Agatha Christie, because uh, she is on the left-hand side of the one on the left. But the one on the right is certainly by her. So that was how Nimrud appeared in 1949 when the Malawans um, arrived there. And this is early attempts at uh, restoring the Northwest Palace, actually by the Iraq Department of Antiquities. It was they uh, who did all this work. It wasn't done by the foreign excavators uh, or anything like that. And uh, this is one of the gate, the first uh, doorways that was um, restored, and that was in the 1950s. Um, I think uh, there are many buildings uh, in uh, Iraq to which the same will apply as to the Northwest Palace at Nimrud. In other words, that they were uh, restored um, in recent times, and what was actually destroyed was more or less a restoration. And that's, I think, the case with the famous Arba'in Mosque uh, in uh, Tikrit. And in these circumstances, uh, I see no reason at all uh, why it, um, it shouldn't be uh, restored. Um, well, this is just uh, an example of what you can do with uh, 3D digital printing, the uh, Arch of Palmyra. But it also allows me to say that uh, the monuments that were destroyed at Palmyra were not as the Palmyrenes had left them, but they were very much left as uh, reconstructed by the French mandate in the 1920s and 1930s. So there really isn't much, diff no, much reason uh, why these uh, things um, shouldn't be put back to the state they were in in the first place. Uh, I just put now on a couple of uh, slides to remind us all that we shouldn't um, uh, in uh, any way be sanctimonious or complacent. Uh, this is the sort of damage that was inflicted in this and other European countries in the, uh, at the time of the uh, Reformation. Uh, people will say that it wasn't as bad as the damage uh, uh, inflicted by ISIS, but that's probably because they didn't have explosives um, at that time. Um, now, just uh, it, what the picture on the left shows uh, a picture of Shakespeare's house, which was demolished as recently as, not so long ago, 1759, uh, simply because the owner was fed up with people coming to Stratford and asking to see where Shakespeare had lived. So he knocked down the house, and nobody said anything about it at the time. And on the right is a picture of a church in West Wales, where in the mid 90s, it's a very interesting uh, 12th, 13th century church. And um, in the mid 19th century, uh, the local landlord decided to take the roof off because he didn't like locals coming so close to his house. So he built another house, another church, uh, a mile away. Uh, now I just want to conclude on what I think is some good news, which is uh, a Basra Museum. Um, 
which was mentioned uh, this morning. Um, there was a museum in Basra up until the time of the uh, first Gulf War, but it was looted um, at that time, that's in 1990, and um, any uh, antiquities that were saved and salvaged were sent back um, to, to Baghdad. It's actually a, a very attractive house, but not really suitable um, as a museum. Well then, um, in 1997, um, General um, Barney White Spunner came to the um, British Museum. He was about to be um, deployed um, to uh, Iraq uh, as the General Officer Commanding Multinational Division Southeast. Uh, and he came to the British Museum asking uh, what he could do to help uh, promote and protect um, Iraqi cultural heritage. And I have to say, uh, he deserves a great deal of credit um, for that because as far as I know, he was almost unique amongst British political, military and diplomatic uh, figures uh, in this respect. Anyway, he came to the museum and he was informed that the most useful thing he could do was do a survey of museums uh, within his area to see which could be restored and perhaps to look at archaeological sites. I've already told you about the visit to the eight archaeological sites uh, which he organized. So this is the museum. Uh, they looked actually at four different museums in southern Iraq and decided that Basra would be the only one which would actually be suitable for uh, restoration, reorganization and so on. And the army engineers um, decided, uh, that decided in, in um, uh, this, this is in cooperation with Iraqi colleagues, including the director of the museum, Khatan al-Abid, that a former palace of Saddam uh, would lend itself uh, very well indeed to being uh, a new museum. It's a very grand uh, building with painted ceilings and uh, ornate um, woodwork. Um, and uh, Khatan... Um, drew up this, fairly speedily, drew up this plan of uh, how the building uh, could be, could be uh, transformed into uh, a um, museum. And uh, initially, uh, well, yeah, I should say that in order to allow funds to be channeled through um, for this project, uh, we had to establish uh, a new charity, which is called um, Friends of um, Basra uh, Museum. And uh, we got uh, a wonderful start with a $500,000 donation uh, from BP. And it was largely thanks to uh, that donation that it proved possible to um, fit out one of the rooms uh, in the museum. There are basically four galleries in the museum. So one of them um, was uh, opened on 27th September 2016. Uh, and you can see here the director, Khatan Al-Abid, next to him, Maysoon Damluji, who's the uh, Iraqi member of parliament responsible for culture, and next to her, the director of the State Board of Antiquities and Heritage. And this is the one room um, that was opened at that time. It's a, it's a, a gallery devoted to the cultural heritage of Basra and the Basra region. Uh, and these are the uh, the objects, some of the objects uh, in the uh, in the cases. There's still work to be done. Um, we have to admit there's no labelling in place at the moment, but I hope that there will be um, before uh, too long. Um, and then um, after that, uh, we were fortunate to get further grants from the um, Cultural Protection Fund. Um, totaling, I think, about um, £600,000 um, altogether. And it was then possible um, to open the remaining three galleries uh, in uh, March um, of this year. These are pictures of the uh, opening um, ceremony. The other three galleries um, are devoted to uh, Babylon, um, to uh, Assyria, and to uh, Sumer. Um, they're all, as you see, color-coded. I wouldn't necessarily have done that myself, but they are color-coded. Um, the Basra one that you just seen was purple uh, in color. 
Uh, I have to say that uh, all of the decisions here um, have been uh, on the Iraqi side. To be perfectly honest, if I had been given a choice, I wouldn't have organized the museum like this with these uh, uh, four galleries, but um, uh, this was the way they wanted to do it, and it very much reflects the uh, Iraqi curriculum and indeed the layout in the Iraq Museum itself, which um, perhaps um, we might uh, refer back to uh, later. Uh, there's also an education room uh, in this uh, museum uh, and another room which um, has not yet been opened is going to be a, a library uh, stocked mostly with books which have been very generously donated by the British Institute for the um, study uh, of, uh, of uh, Iraq. Uh, on the right uh, you can see um, a, 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 a 3D uh, print of one of these Lamassu figures which has been made uh, in Italy. Actually, I forgot to mention when we were on the subject of Nimrud that the firm Factum Arte in Madrid has made a, a series of replicas of all of the reliefs in Ashen Archipel's throne room. Um, they, they did it after judicial scanning and uh, they did at some stage send all of these uh, reliefs to Mosul. I'm not quite sure what uh, has happened to them now, but no doubt uh, new versions could be made if necessary, and these could certainly be put into a reconstructed um, Asher Nazipal palace. Um, well, I just uh, will uh, finish with uh, this image, which is a group of um, school pupils visiting this new uh, museum uh, in Basra. Obviously young people are the key to the future and moving forward uh, we need to think how uh, the world uh, can help them to protect cultural heritage and I think myself um, there are two ways. Uh, one is by uh, investing more resources in education of course that's hugely important uh, and the second is by promoting what is known as positive peace and everything um, that uh, that uh, entails. Perhaps we might talk a little bit about uh, that later. Well, my time's up now, so uh, on that note, I'll uh, stop and thank you for listening. <laughs>